we thought we will go into some small aspects of uh, neurology, philosophy, psychiatry, borders on links, you know. Uh, so that I thought, how we perceive things, that is the basis of uh, uh, all human endeavors. We perceive, we interact, we learn, we react. So I thought I will just go through the beauty, a small aspect of the beauty of uh, human perception. And uh, I think the most beautiful thing that we perceive is the beautiful feet of Krishna. So I thought I will start with that. Then I have to, I am now old, retired. Hmm? So I think uh, whatever I do proactively, little deviant from the usual classes uh, is also taught by my teachers the way they told me to lead my life. So it starts with the um, thanks giving to my teachers. These are my parents, my father and mother, uh, who were such wonderful role models in this world. These are my teachers. This is Professor K. Srinivasan, who is the one of the founder neurologists of this country. And still he is uh, the best neurologist probably in the world as a clinician. I have not seen a, a more beautiful clinician than my teacher, Professor K. Srinivasan Madhuri. And uh, this uh, sir is uh, also my teacher, Professor D. Ramasubramaniam. And he is the first student of my teacher and he is uh, my teacher. He is teacher for, you know, both of them are my teachers and he is the first student of my teacher from Mother Dr. D. Ramasubramaniam. And many people help us to uh, lay our path. And uh, as uh, I am uh, a very ordinary mortal from <laughs> this country and many people were unselfishly uh, guiding me of whom many, many people did it, of whom some important pillars were Mathi Charyan Sar, Patayam, Shenai Sar, Alepi, D. Nagaraja Sar, Bangalore, and Dr. Suresh Nair, um, Sri Jitra. They are all very unselfishly, they helped me in critical times. So I could go on with my career. So we'll uh, understand what is this perception. So the physical properties of the world getting transformed into uh, prop, proper understood information. So, so many things are there in the world, but it gets transformed into something which we call as valid information. So that is the uh, phenomena which underlies perception. So I will go through this uh, beautiful thing with the definition, the various levels, modalities in a very brief way. And uh, assessment, only the visual part I will cover because there is so many other things which will not be possible and some small philosophy of perception. So perception is the phenomena which converts sensation into an experience. So, so many things, visual, auditory, somato, sensory, all factory, all those informations are there, but that information becomes an experience. That is uh, that phenomena which makes that experience is called perception. It is a set of processes which involves recognizing, organizing, and making sense out of sensation. So we see some many things. We don't attend to everything. And what we attend is based on our goals. Then we organize that information and make sense out of that and utilize in our life and other people's life. So this is perception. This is the basis of all fundamental activities of the nervous system. And how the human brain functions continues to puzzle scientists and thinkers alike, but it functions. So according to this uh, psychologist, he says that the sense organs are not force of perception. We might imagine that it is the sense organs which are sensing and uh, uh, making us work. It is really not so. So sense organs, so it is top down otherwise. So sense organs are not doors of perception, transparent to the properties of the environment. It's not just mechanically like luggage is transported in the train or flight. It is not like that. Instead, they are used as a centrifugal sense, as a feeler outside from the uh, inner organ of perception. So it is not just a thing which carries information and brain is just making a mathematics. It is not like that. Instead, the brain is using them as an uh, agency to collect information from the environment. And they are instrumental in updating a map of the outside world and the organism as part of the world. So we are a part of the world. 
and the world is there and these sense organs give information and update the system it is not that and the information is completely taken through the various sense organs that is evident from even a congenitally blind person can learn uh, so many things uh, even though he cannot utilize a particular afferent input so that means it is a top down information gathering by the brain and which is updated by the sense organs so the role of periphery varies from moment to moment and uh, at the organizational level of behavior you know that what information is available outside is dynamic it is constantly changing uh, so it is not stationary for the sense organs to give a fixed information and the sensory motor system is operated for updating the map and also for calibrating movements so dynamism is taking place in the environment so the information is updated so that the top down uh, information processing system dynamically calibrates its output to act on the perceptual world which is dynamic so it uh, central nervous system uh, calibrates what it should do on the information which is brought by the sense organs so mind responds to perception and not reality so these multiple factors are involved in what we perceive from what is available in the environment and mind responds to perception and not reality supposing a cat thinks it is a tiger it will act like a tiger and this perception involves attention memory emotions what you want to be some people may be really tigers but they will think that they are cats vice versa both are there so attention memory emotions motivation goals that have been set thoughts and feelings so perception is not just the information carried by the sense organ but it is a sum total of several cognitive functions which gives the ultimate meaning of what is perceived so how does the perception starts in the child at birth the instinct based cues of mother that is called imprinting the child will know the heart beat of the mother because it was just under the diaphragm listening to the heart beat so it will understand that rhythm so that way it will recognize that is imprinting and within 9 minutes of birth it can track the face of the mother and in 2 days it fixes at the emotional face of the mother at 30 cm so it can understand the different emotions partly within 2 days but the acuity is only about 30 cm it is said that it is correlating the uh, between the milk that the child is getting and the source of the milk so that is also uh, from where is this food coming to me so that much distance is the acuity that is present on 2 days and by 3 weeks it can imitate with inner map of the muscle activity of the mother so mother will uh, show anger or happiness or whatever it is so many more movements are taking place so those things could be understood and partly imitated also within 3 weeks by 3 months child can recognize speech and face and by 6 months categorizes using cues so it is at that time the stranger anxiety develops at the 6 months the child will know this is my mother this is my father this is a stranger so it categorizes using cues who should be avoided who should be uh, taken into so that kind of understanding starts by 6 months so vocal learning is optimal during the sensitive period so during sensitive period and critical period for learning uh, young children exposed to languages can speak the language fluently like the mother tongue so in the early period we should not think that the child's capacity is less it is at that time the perception is very maximum and how many languages you introduce in the phonetically correct way to that child at that time the child will speak it as if it is its uh, mother tongue so human babies by 3 weeks of age can make perceptual distinctions between the various sounds and the languages uh, even when it is uh, unexposed you can distinguish this is one sound and this is a language so you can differentiate and categorize even though it may not understand correctly if not exposed to a foreign language by adolescence most humans cannot learn or speak that language in a manner that is indistinguishable from the native speakers primarily in accent and grammatical usage so early exposure is very important 
this inability seems to reflect decreased perceptual abilities and not simply limits on the ability to produce the sounds of speech. So perception selection is normally also there. So many things are there. As I said, uh, you see, it, we will imagine that a big brain means big brain will gather all the information. No, a big brain will triage, it will filter off things which are not wanted. So what the brain does is prioritize information and filter off. There is so many millions of information available to all sense organs. If the body starts uh, responding to all of them, we will be suffering from what we call as ADHD. You are not attending to one, you are attending to everything. So you will be not focused on anything. So to prevent this ADHD, what the brain does is it triages, filters off. And that even within the self-information, there is triaging. Supposing somebody is touched on the face and the hand simultaneously with the same intensity, face is perceived first and hand. So there is triaging, that's a simple experiment to say that the less serious information is filtered off and the more serious information is uh, sent inside. So this now we know that by perceiving the away, uh, needed information, the brain drains order from chaos. So there is chaos everywhere and brain has to select, triage and use only what is relevant by biological goals and set goals. So this Principle of perception is draining order from chaos. So how does it do? do? We have got the end organs, vision, and and that is the faculty of raw sensibility. Then you have got those faculties have an end organ based perception. Eyes can only see, ears can only hear. So you have got the end organs and those end organs have got focused perceiving capacity and this information is sent inside and it is understood what is spoken or what is seen is carried to the cortical areas where it is understood. And after understanding what is spoken, the meaning is extracted by some areas of the brain. And then it becomes the mental representation of what has been seen in the environment or heard in the environment. And that leads to a phenomenon called the fruits of perception. What is the fruits of perception? You become more knowledgeable, you become a better human being, more happy or more sad or how you know to react. That is the fruits of perception. Several, several, several fruits of perception ultimately lead us to what we are uh, in our journey through life. So how these perceptions are made? The sensory messages produce a spatial pattern of receptor mediated activity. What we mean by that is, let us imagine that there is a picture. So that picture will produce so many patterns. So this will fall on the retina where we all know that we have got movement perceiving cells, stationary or object perceiving cells, condor perceiving cells, color perceiving cells. So the scene object is split into various frequencies and these frequencies end up in the primary relay site of the concerned sensory organ. So it is split into various frequencies. So the primary relay site makes an image out of this frequency. So these frequencies, each frequency means something. One frequency may be condor, another frequency may be color. So this primary relay site makes an image out of these various frequencies and transports it to the cortical area for reassembly. So what it goes is an object is there, it is split into various frequencies and these frequencies reach the end organ where the end organ has got different receptors to pick up different frequencies and it is transported to the cortical areas after categorization and there it is reassembled. So meaning learned information is formed. So it is reassembled in the primary sensory area and the sensory association area. For example, an object is seen it is split into several frequencies. Those frequencies are perceived by the concerned receptors in the retina. From that retina, it is categorized. This much information is of this much hertz, that much is that much hertz, and it goes to the sensory cortex where it is reassembled and categorized in the various frequencies. And this goes to the association area where some concepts are added. You see some 
just start some colors lines directions so that becomes a concept in the concerned sensory association area and this concept that this is and this concept is carried to the endorhinal area in the um, temporal lobe where even the vision is the sense i am telling an example it will go to the temporal lobe and reach the endorhinal area where it will say this flower is a beautiful one or this flower indicates love something like that so it goes to the endorhinal area and other cognitive areas based on experience and expectation so previously somebody would have told us when you are small that this flower is to be offered to the god so it is very sacred so that previous experience and what you expect out of a color and the contour based percept it is information on in the endorhinal area and the medial prefrontal cortex ma makes value based decisions on this information so you are seeing a dolasi leaf so what am i going to do this so should i pluck it today or uh, is it an auspicious day correct enough to pluck it or should i water and worship and go so that kind of information is given to us by the prefrontal cortex so concerned association area, concerned sensory area association area then meaning and adver adverb and adjective is added in the endorhinal area and the ability to make decisions and act is done by the prefrontal cortex but one thing music is remaining like that music does not have receptors we split it and reassemble that so because of that it is said that because this splitting and reassembly is not there for music it goes and puts the whole brain in a vibratory mode so music is one thing which will not be lost even till the late phases of degenerative diseases so the synapses remain because there is no splitting so multiple organs are not involved it is a whole brain into vibration so it is a holistic function so music is a very important thing which improves the cognitive reserve because the it is not complexly processed it is straight away processed by the whole brain so we have what is the dorsal tier all of us know from the frontal lobe through the parietal lobe to the occipital lobe is the dorsal tier or wire what we saw wire is that that is the dorsal tier and the path which goes to the temporal lobe what we saw what is that <laughs> the endorhinal area and all is the medial temporal region that is the ventral tier and mental rotation and manipulation takes place at the post central gyrus that is uh, as we all know that when we see an object our one direction that is in front of us is very clear and two dimension is also clear only but the third dimension is completion and so when we see an object we know it has got a front it has got a side and so it should have a back so the third dimension is by the brain construction and then you know this is an apple or this is a mango because the third dimension is completed by the brain by mental rotation how does the mental rotation takes place repeatedly we would have seen that object in multiple views and that image is there in the default mode in the brain so when it sees two dimension it will complete it and then it will make a holistic interpretation our vision is limited by good perception for two dimensions only third dimension is constructed beyond that we don't have the capacity <laughs> so this lower order perception that is end organ based vision or audition that is called lower order perception this lower order perception is end organ dependent that is a visual apparatus or tactile apparatus it is end organ dependent it is inflexible how much frequencies are uh, an object producing how, how it is split how it is assembled it is constant so it is inflexible and it is made of a phenomena called jungle along wiring what we mean by that immediately you should identify a lion if you are a deer and you should make a uh, run for your life so this phenomena at the lower order is for survival so it is called jungle along wiring and it is based for survival it is default in everybody and it is not learned it is there gifted to us by almighty so dorsal and ventral tier i said wire and what and there can be topological or hodological topological perception means where is it situated 
Quarter logical means what are all the people behind this plotting, uh, plotting that is taking place. So it will not be one, it is one team. So that is a quarter logical percept. It may be hyper perception or a hyper perception. You see something, but you think it is very dangerous. Or you see something, you think you don't have to react. So these are the various kind of reactions which happen after an end organ carries some information. So uh, neurobiological theories of perception is there is probably three stages are involved for conscious perception. Evaluation of the sensory inputs, so auditory input, tactile input, olfactory input that is happening as I said, split and reassembled. Then you are trying to evaluate the sensory input. Then you go into, after evaluating that sensory input, you go into a conscious experience. For example, a bad smell is coming. Then you know that, oh, this bad smell means a rotten um, food waste is there somewhere. So it goes into a conscious experience or a feeling state. And the expression of the physiological and behavioral response. So first the sensory input, input is evaluated and that gives an experience to the endorhinal cortex. And that goes to the frontal attentional area and frontal area will tell if it is a good one, uh, you will feel elated, you are hyperactive, you jump and dance and go and capture that flower. Or if you are sad you, or you are frightened, you tremble, you shiver, you sweat. So that is a physiological and behavioral response to that feeling state. And then you have got an unconscious percept that is totally non-end organ dependent percept, which is a default, which is not seen in ordinary human beings, but for the highly evolved people who can switch off the end organs and perceive from the universe. So percept generated is not simply analyzed and coded. As we have understood, I have made it in the simplest possible way. And there is an operational link between the stimuli and the objective world instantiated in processing according to success or failure of the stimuli by evolutionary and individual time. So you see a small thing, like what I said, you see a flower and what that flower did to you long back. So that stimuli just produces some frequencies, but it becomes an experience by what you have read in your textbook what that man meant when uh, one fatal equipment is there, which Hitler used to behead so many people. So it's immediately the whole lot of information which you have read or which you might have experienced, all this goes through your brain and that leads to the uh, effect that you are going to do on that person. So we have got, so what is, uh, happening it is level one perception is there that is end organ dependent level two is interface uh, that is uh, where adverse and adjectives are added to the person and level three is neurophilosophy where percept doesn't need an end organ and level four is highest degree of percept where it does not involve the material world at all so abnormalities of perception we will not be able to discuss all the five levels even this level is very much simplified, it is a very beautiful neurophilosophical topic. And I think our ancestors used their naked sense organs to get all the information, not PET scan or MRI scan or anything. They were highly evolved people. So to read what is written itself, it takes so many, so many hours. And I am sure that there will be people who are more knowledgeable who can update and help. I have tried to make an understanding of this beauty called uh, the neurological basis of perception in a very, very, very small fractionated way. So lower order perception that level one involves vision, audition, touch, olfaction, taste and gestation. So that is the end organ. Next is the interface, which begins when concepts are introduced into perception from the unimodal primary and unimodal association area. Like what I told, you see it's a flower. Okay, then you say this is a very beautiful flower. So that is the interface level where adjects and adverbs are, adjective and adverbs are added to the perception. It can be concrete. So you have seen the just art color, condor, and you make a interpretation and when that is called, uh, when uh, that fails, it results in conditions called agnosias. 
So your under, end organ is normal only, but you do not recognize what you see. All of us knew this, oh, we have a, uh, all neurologists and the physicians know about this phenomena called agnosia, where the end organ is normal, still you do not understand. That is the interface failure. It can be perceptive or associative, that I will elaborate later. And it can be an abstract perception also. Like for example, you see an act of killing, but what will be the interpretation? If you are killing for your personal gain, you get your property or money or something like that, that is a criminal activity. That is the perception you get of the uh, information received. But somebody is killing in the war field, it becomes a very sacrificial act. So what is seen is the same. What is seen through the end organ is the same, but the meaning varies depending on the context. That is the abstract interpretation. So agony becoming ectasy and vice versa. For example, uh, you supposing you work without food or sleep or anything for three, four days. When we were students, we used to have something called bedside duty. So sometimes our teachers used to tell us, you will not move out till I relieve you. So we all learn to starve and work. So that becomes agony. But at the end of that, if the patient sits up and smiles, it becomes ecstasy. So that is, your percept becomes opposite. Experience becomes opposite. So that is uh, abstract interpretation at interfa uh, interface level. <coughs> That is the neurophilosophy. That is percept independent of end organ. It involves a wide range of intuitive understanding and parts of the brain are innately structured around few domains critical for goals. That is, uh, without any information, we know people who are telling that in this part of the country, tomorrow it is going to rain. They did not use any forecasting or anything. They have got some intuitive understanding, which is not dependent on information got from the environment. So that is the third level of perception. And the fourth level of perception is beyond brain perception. So brain can transcend the boundaries of logic and reason and experience states of awareness commonly not recognized. It is in this state where people, when evaluated, they look like brain dead people. And it is supposed that in this phase, they could see the previous yugas and they wrote the epics, Vedas, and all those things were written when they switched off their end organs and got the information from the universe. So now what is the summary to summary? There is a unimodal percept through the sensory organ and there is a cross-sensory association that gives meaning. And there is a cognitive network operation through the endorhinal cortex and the prefrontal region and the medial orbitofrontal cortex and the temporal lobe, which ultimately leads to what you call as experience of what is perceived. What is this Durya state? It's the fourth state where the person is aware, awake, inactive externally and active internally. And EEG will show silence. And there is high intellectual activity, extraordinary state of consciousness and answers to very serious questions become available at this phase. And that is why they wrote all the great epics uh, and uh, all those things at this phase. And the deepest delta brain state. So if you do the EEG, it will show very slow delta, end stage encephalitis like it will look like. Next is consciousness. Ultimately, it is all into consciousness that things are fed, that we experience it. So that, what is consciousness according to Ken Obanishad? That which eyes cannot see, ears cannot hear, nose cannot smell, mind cannot think, but because of which the eyes see, the ears hear, the nose smells, and the mind feels. So at lower level, it serves as a gatekeeper, triaging the millions of information which comes streaming through our sense organs. That's what I told that. Um, so many things are filtered off and then what is important alone is captured um, by the brain using this information as a feeler and processing takes place at consciousness level. So that is level one over. Level one involves four principles. One is just start, points of illusion, closure and completion. 
So what is all this? I will tell. So this is just start principle. You see, primary perception involves. So supposing you see an object, it involves the background. So where is it is a painted on a white paper or whatever it is. Then closure. You, here you can see that there is a monkey, a lion and a tree. So the monkey is not drawn there. It is only a space. So you close the space and make a monkey. So that phenomenon is called closure. Then proximity. So you can forget the monkey and just see the tree also. So which is uh, proximity, it is uh, how the tree is constructed and you forget about the monkey. And similarity, two things are categorized by comparing the similarity. And illusory, and condor, continuity, completion. And so all these phenomena involve what is called gestalt. So all these principles together form the end organ perception. So it uh, studies the background, it studies, it closes the outlines, it compares the proximity, categorizes based on similarity, looks at the illusory aspect of the image, uh, sees the condor, makes the continuity and draws a tree and completes what is incomplete and viewed information is based on what we chose to be view. So you see all this information is gathered. Now you can decide you want to see the lion or you want to see the monkey or you want to see the tree. So this is another example, an ambiguous figure that can be perceived either as a vase or as two faces. That's the first principle of end organ perception just taught. No? Next is the closure. Here we are seeing only so many black dots, but all of us can connect it and see that it is a dog. But actually no dog is drawn. It is only so many dots. So how it is perceived as a dot, dog, dog by a phenomena called closure. So end organ uses just start, closure, or points or illusion and completion. So in one sense, this picture is just a number of dark regions separated from each other by a continuous expanse of white. However, that is not what you perceive. The principle of closure explains why you perceive a dog rather than a set of random regions. <clears throat> so this is another example. The white triangle is not there. It is not drawn. It is only left like that. But you see a white triangle. This is uh, completion. So white triangle is not at all there. Some space is left. You uh, complete the uh, left out area and see a white triangle there. Next, we'll come to the uh, interface. So where adjectives are introduced, what is the Ponzo illusion is by drawing uh, parallel lines, which become narrower and narrower. That third part, I think the PPT got missed. Uh, it gives a three dimensional percept that is called Ponzo illusion. So end organ uses just start closure, completion and Ponzo illusion. That is a visual illusion by which a two dimensional picture looks like a three dimensional picture. You draw two lines, narrow, narrow, narrow. Then you see that it is far. The narrowest part is far. Then what is that interface level, second level, where adjectives are introduced to percept beyond the programmed percept. So what we saw is the programmed percept based on very clearly defined parameters. And uh, next, you have got a top down and a bottom up perceptual set. What is the top down where the perceiver builds the construct of the cognitive understanding? We have the uh, example, if neurology students are here, they know that we can record in the laboratory a very sharp potential. Even before we consciously know that we are going to move our hand, the brain produces the waveforms. So who decided that from where this information came? It is possible to record this by back average. So we do it in our laboratory. So it is not hypothetical. So there is a top-down information processing. Even before we decide on the environmental percept, brain decides you will move your hand to the right side. That is top-down. And bottom-up is transporting information to higher order structures. So right hemisphere versus left hemisphere. Right hemisphere has more cortical, subcortical connections. So the emotional aspect, the behavioral aspects, the abstract intellectual content, 
all that is more on the right than the left. The perceptual, cognitive, and expressive phenomena contribute different patterns of emotional reactivity in the right hemisphere. Uh, uh, only thing is language and praxis is on the left side. But uh, the finer aspects of experience is uh, on the right side. Then what is this action perception system? Information seen is mapped in the motor representatives of the actions of the observer. So we know that perception is a sensory function, but there is an action perception. Somebody is beaten. So where do you perceive it? This somebody is beaten is mapped in our motor area, not in the sensory area and recognized as non-self. So it is mapped in the motor area that somebody is meet, beaten on his hand. But your body will give sense self-information. You see, your right hand is here. My body schema is here. It is not beaten. So that we call as cocoons of selfishness. So we get our body information. And so you think that I am not beaten. Somebody else is beaten. But if self-information is removed, it has been shown in patients who became amputated in wars long years back. And that self-information is not there for the right hand, let us imagine. So somebody is beaten on the right side. And somebody who is watching this act is uh, not having that body part for a long time. Then he feels the beating on the other person as if it is on his own self. His empathy and sympathy will be much more and he may react also. So that is evidence that it is only because of self-information, we are selfish. If self-information is removed, you understand very easily that we are part of the universal consciousness. So next is the level three. So here, intuitive understanding without end organ mediated perception, reasoning the infinite information in strange ways. So, so much information uh, may be there in your brain, you may be going on thinking and you reason it on write poetry or write textbooks, you know, even though at that point of time, there is no direct thing that you saw or you read or you heard, but from your brain, you write uh, materials and poetry and the creative activity without any end organ giving information, write poetry like this, no, or write, uh, draw, draw a painting like this. So that is without end organ, uh, you, the infinite information which have been received before is converted into a strange information that becomes very unique. And uh, so at that point of time, end organ has no role. And one knows are considered as likely from intuitive feeling rather than conscious reasoning. Like we know the intuitions, uh, clairvoyance, telepathy, you, uh, you communicate with people far away or you say that in this part of the country, it is going to have an earthquake. All these things, uh, people correctly predict how did that information reach them. So that is non-end organ uh, based percept. And I am sure that uh, many uh, recent scientists, uh, for example, uh, we have, I have once heard the talk of uh, Dr. Samson on myasthenia who found out the immunological basis of myasthenia. When one of his pet student uh, was uh, dying with myasthenia. That is a myasthenia gravis. It's a fatal disease once upon a time. And then he was so much uh, sad and he thought about it. And then he suddenly got an idea from nowhere that it is probably immune mediated. So what was the source? Nothing. Long back when uh, you cannot use the laboratory to do the ACHR antibody. So that time he say he I have heard his talk directly. He told he got an intuitive idea when his brain went through severe stress. So that may be more useful information, but it cannot be demonstrated to others like Cox postulates because it is based on the capacity of the individual. So extrasensory perception, that's, a, uh, that's what we are talking about. It is a paranormal ability pertaining to reception of information not gained through recognized physical sense. That is extrasensory perception, paranormal ability. So it is, it cannot be uh, shown to another person. I am seeing, so you also see that you cannot see, like Ox postulates cannot be proved in this situation. So it is an individual capacity. 
So what is this clairvoyance? Perceive future events or beyond normal sensory contact. All of us uh, go to scholars and ask about uh, future things. Some of them are really wonderful. Uh, so that is also true. I feel it is all true. And what is telepathy? Communications of thoughts or ideas by means other than the known ones. So instead of through phone or uh, through mobile, we communicate information in frequencies which goes and reaches the other person. It does happen. I am sure that if you have loved ones who are sick, we get that panic. Suddenly we get up in the middle of the night and make a phone call and ask. So it is all uh, true. And the intuition is the ability to understand instinctively without the need for conscious reason. This happens in, a, uh, in the life of most of us, intuition. I think if you are very committed to your patients, even diagnosis just comes and strikes. Uh, I have met it many, many times. And uh, once, uh, I don't know, uh, once I have seen uh, a child who was lying unresponsive, brought from another area, we didn't know what was happening. All investigations were negative. She was unresponsive for nearly three, four weeks. We, uh, then uh, there was a person who sings in the hospital. So I called that person to sing a song. He was a nursing assistant who used to sing. And he sang a song calling Krishna to show his mercy. Suddenly it struck me, it may be Linda Cliffner syndrome, where MRI will not show anything, metabolic workup will not show anything, nothing will show. What will show is the EEG. Nobody did the EEG because they thought it is the simplest investigation for that child. So immediately it struck me, it may be Linda Cliffner. So I took the child to the EEG lab, we did the EEG, we found the typical pattern and very easily you can demonstrate like myasthenia with neostigmine test, you give an IV or a sip pump, child becomes suddenly alerted and child suddenly woke up like waking up from sleep and asked why nobody is talking. So this all, uh, because there's no way you, have, you can reason out why is the child comatose, it's a drug or hypoxia or hypoglycemia or neurometabolic disorders, or some encephalitis, encephalitis, all this. Linda Cliffner is an ictal phenomena happening in the silent area of the brain. So the ictal phenomena is silency. So it's very rare disease and uh, unless you have uh, intuitive understanding, it's very difficult to diagnose that condition. So this happened and many other examples I know which I will, I will not be telling now. So dreams indicate Without an object, brain can produce images. All of us have dreams where we see people whom we know, whom we do not know. Where are these people coming from? Some of them, you would have never seen them before. So that is an evidence. All of us have dreamt. That's an evidence that perception can take place without an object to perceive. Thus, are, I am telling narrations for third level perception, where perception takes place without an organ. All of us might have dreamt at least once. Many things we would have seen in our dream which we have never seen before, from where those images came. So that means end organ is not always needed to create experiences and images. And Indians believe the whole world as illusion. Dreaming becomes a personal experience, shell path towards the realization of the illusory nature of the self and all reality. So in dream, because many people dream, it is accepted as normal. So if the same dream, takes place in wakefulness. That may be the illusion of the seen world. So if you can have a dream in your sleep, why not have a dream in our wakefulness? So that is the Maya concept or the world of illusion. So we, when dream produces images, wakefulness can also produce images. So it is extrapolated and we contemplate that world is Maya. Next is the highest order perception. So uh, that is epsilon state, a situation of heightened intellectual activity where pure consciousness is removed from the limitations of the physical senses and evaluation will reveal all parameters of a brain dead person. But highly creative, non-end organ dependent perception will be taking place. So Indian thinkers say the world is a perceptual illusion and it is a projection of things and forms that are temporarily faced and sustain the illusion of oneness and permanence. So it is all illusion. All of us know that there is uh, no permanence in this. 
Why did we come to this world? Why are you going away? Why do we think many things are suffering? So we don't have the answer and I don't think anybody can give answer even though we try to lean on each other for support which may or may not be available most of the time. So created and sustained by standalone objects thrown together by an act of ra randomness or through the deliberate choice of the conscious will. As I said, you can see the lion or you can see the tree or you can see the monkey. So you what you see and sustain in that huge illusion is your choice. So the world is nothing but a mere vibration of consciousness in space. All this is but Maya. For here, there is no contradiction between the infinite consciousness and the apparent existence of the universe. So in the fourth level, there is no conflict because sense organ is not carrying erratic information. So it is like the marvelous dream of a person who is awake. So dream as a model of perception, uh, uh, that is what I explained. So this is what uh, Einstein said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind, which is what many of us do. So there is a need for constant research. At one point, what appears as truth becomes wrong. So you have to do research. So intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant. That is the Cox postulate. You have to show it to others. Then only you prove it as truth. But who is having the perceptive equipment? Everybody do not have. So that is what Einstein is saying. Unfortunately, our science demands you make others also experience what you experience. Then only it becomes truth. So major part of the real truth cannot be made uh, truth to others. Then abnormalities can happen at level one, that, that is gnosis. Uh, these things are a little away from. So this is all of us know a modality specific ability to access semantic information of an object or stimulus in the presence of normal perception. So when your normal end organ is there, you get all these things processed together and get an experience that is gnosis. And agnosia is non-availability of that. So visual non-verbal comprehension, uh, how does it take place? That the emotions, emotions are non-verbal, not expressed, but you comprehend affective expressions. That is more on the right side. So the just art and other things are perceived on the left side, whereas affective components are perceived on the right side. Affective, empathy, sympathy, creativity, all this is on the right side. Disorders happen when there is sensory distortion at all levels, one, two, three, four levels I have gone through. So at all levels, sensory distortions can happen, deception can happen, abnormal data linking. I said a flower is seen, it is linked with beauty, it is linked with the past experience or what is in the literature, so that is called data linking. So data linking can go wrong and abnormality in effectively perceiving and reacting through the prefrontal loop and or displacement, one sensation become displaced into another, which can be intra modality. Within the touch modality mean, it can touch can become pain, pain can become temperature and uh, all interest, that is intra modality. Trans modality means somebody is speaking, you say that you spoke in, mm, you showed me a picture. So heard sound becomes a visual experience. That is trans modality, we call it a synesthesia, which is a true things which happens, letters, names become colors. So that is trans modality. One modality becomes displaced into another modality of perception due to displacement and extra corporeal. These are real life things. If you see cognitively altered persons in front of us and spend some few hours with them, you can demonstrate so many phenomena. You touch the nose of the patient and tell him, ask him, why did I touch you, sir? Then he will say, you touched your nose and he might come and touch our nose. We will think it is very funny, but that is extra corporeal displacement of the perception. And there can be defect in the perception of size, shape, direction. What is on the right side may be perceived on the left side. So these are all displacements. So aberration in perception, which look closely like a psychiatric syndrome, which it is all organic. And when the perception becomes small, it is really put in hallucination and Charles Bond syndrome. These are too familiar for us. I have told the anatomy, physiology in a most abridged way. Now some common aberrations which we see in perception, 
So visual hallucinations of human and animal figures in patients with visual problems in the absence of other psychopathology is Charles Bonner syndrome. Extra combined hallucinations. So uh, hallucinations outside the field of perception. So somebody will tell that I got a phantom message from my village that something is going to happen. So that is called extra combined. These are the principles which I just told that all these things can happen. So from my village, I am receiving like clairvoyance. Hmm? Then reflex hallucinations, a morbid variety of synesthesia in which a stimulus in one modality, like seeing someone laugh, produces a sensation in another modality. That is a displacement, a pain in the chest. Whenever I see my friend laughing, I get a chest pain. So that is a displacement from one modality to another. That is the principle I discussed just now. Then autoscopy, visual hallucination of one's own self. You see your own self as a hallucinatory figure. Negative autoscopy, not seeing one's reflection in a mirror. And functional hallucination occur only in the presence of an external stimuli, but is perceived separately. Hearing voices only when a fan is switched on. And uh, so these are uh, or modality specific hallucinations occurring in a linked fashion to a stimulus. Altered perception. These things we can see in the bedside. Hypnagogic and hypnocombic, that is sleep onset and sleep end or waking up. Imperative, that is voices giving commands and somatic passivity, somatic hallucination with a delusional element of being caused by an external agency. So this is seen in mental illness. All of us know that there is nothing called mental illness either at the chemical level or the structural level, it is all neurological. And experiential hallucinations of past memory is very much common. The in temporal lobe epilepsy, ARA, people say deja vu, jamai vu, deja vu, deja attendu, where people suddenly feel that this place is very familiar to me. Then they go into a unconscious state. Or they feel that this is, where am I standing? This is not my house. How did I reach here? So you feel it is not your place. Or suddenly you feel you have lived through the era of Hitler or you have heard something before. So these are all very, very common as R of epilepsy. I am sure all medicine students and neurology students knew this. So that means where is this information processed? What is this perceptual delusion? You suddenly imagine you lived through the Dwabara Yuga. So all these are coming from the brain. How does it come? It has been seen very well. Many of us, if you are sat by the bedside and listen to patients and don't uh, rub it off as psychiatry, you will see all these things. Then formication, tactile hallucination of insects crawling, and um, then phantom limb, perception of sensation from a limb that has been amputated, and synesthetic, bizarre visceral hallucinations in schizophrenia, all these, and phantom limb movement, fully paralyzed, uh, patient experiences movement in the paralyzed limb. So here, uh, uh, perception evaluation, I will just rush through. No, so that is only vision, I will say. We have saw the just start. So criteria for diagnosis of agnosia. This is important for our students taking exam. So how are you going to call a person as having agnosia? Failure to recognize the sensory perception. That is mandatory. You see an object and you don't recognize. Is it agnosia or something else? That's the next question. Then you see the normal perception of the object. So there should be some evidence. Somehow you have to prove that he has perceived it but not recognized. Then only it becomes agnosia. And elementary sensory disorder is excluded. So he should not be blind. He still he should not be seen. And the ability to name the object once it is recognized, rolling out anomia. So supposing you give the, give the object in his hand, then he will name, no. So it is modality specific failure. By vision, he is not able to name by touch, isn't it? So then it be, and visual end organ is normal. There is no dementia. So that is the criteria for agnosia. But the most difficult thing when somebody is saying, I'm not seeing, how are you going to demonstrate that this person's end organ is normal? That's the most difficult thing. So you can, uh, sometimes you can do the optokinetic nystagmus. Or uh, sometimes uh, suddenly you bring an object, patient might move. Optokinetic nystagmus can be uh, demonstrated, and that way you can use smaller and smaller squares, and you can measure the visual activity that way. 
uh, or you uh, sometimes they will understand contours and colors and movement so they may move their head this side and that way so you have to wait uh, patiently to get close that the end organ is intact, intact normal apart from examination the pupil fundus and uh, vep all those things uh, still you know, to say that person has vision you can do optokinetic nystagmus you can uh, he can fix for fundoscopic examination how is he fixing he has to fix on the light that means he is seeing unless he sees a blind <coughs> person cannot fix so if he fixes for fundoscopic examination you know that his vision is there like that by some abstract method you have to demonstrate the end organ is normal and this agnosia may be apperceptive or associative i just told that condor just start conso illusion and completion is taking place so if those things are failing that is called apperceptive agnosia if it is completion phenomena that is failing it is associative agnosia so if a person is an apperceptive he cannot copy that image because he is not perceiving the contour color direction nothing so he will not recognize he will not copy whereas associative person is recognizing all the gestures but he is not making an assembly so he will say i do not know what it is he cannot copy but he can copy but he cannot make so patient is unable to recognize the object but he is able to copy that that is associative that means gestures is there assembly is not there so like we went through level 1 2 3 4 so first is the frequencies which are split reassembled uh, formulated that fails is apperceptive so such a person cannot copy whereas this information is processed in the other area that fails is associative so the gestures is there so he can copy but still he will not know it can involve several functions it may be shape form or integration or it can be one modality olfactory visual auditory tactile or it can be only for objects or only for faces only for color or only for sounds and it can be for failure to recognize living things or failure to recognize moving things or it can it can be small objects or big objects or it is failure to recognize texture failure to recognize length so so many phenomena are separately impaired at the first level uh, second level of perception when the end organ itself is organ so these are the various categories of agnosia which can be apperceptive associative it can be visual auditory or, or tactile it can be for shape or form it can be for object or face it can be for living thing it can be for non living thing it can be for small object it can be for big object can be for texture or can be for length so as i said end organ is difficult to demonstrate but recognize by indirectly by blind sight suddenly you bring a foreign body towards the eye he will remove that then you ask him why did you bring your hand and remove my uh, hand he will say in our did it because he is not consciously recognizing but reflexly acting and then uh, you can do the okay and tap fixing for ophthalmoscopic examination somebody is moving he may turn his head so all these methods you will know that the end organ is all right then uh, you have got suggest uh, hemispheric basis of gnosis suggest the evidence that disorders in the ability to appreciate shape size and other spatial attributes of stimulus may be more on the right side the language and praxis component is on the left side and the spatial attributes is on the right side because of that when the right side is diseased they can have agnosia on both sides but when there is left side is diseased it is only on the right side now it's a visual apparatus so i said only one thing i will uh, test so what is this visual all this cannot be covered so visual uh, system is a dynamic system which adapts itself to the needs of the subject based on the task he needs to perform with his vision so when we take perception vision is a very complex thing and it is the most common thing so that is why i took this to elaborate little more and other things if we if we get time in some uh, session when there are no takers we can finish the other modalities so vision is important for the person to carry out the task he needs to perform with his vision so vision is not just to see it is to make the person perform the task which he wants to do with his vision so vision is an active process requiring expectations 
and hypothesis testing. And images projected on the retina are only lights and colors. That is what I told, it becomes split into frequencies and reaction. Only lights and colors are projected in the retina. Finally, it becomes transformed into a phenomena where you perform your actions based on the information. So vision is useful only if it delivers a message to other parts of the neurosis. And behavioral goal is the end product that vision should deliver. This particular thing is safe. This is good, that is dangerous. So that is the thing that it should deliver. And you should tailor to the behavioral needs of the species. So it is not a passive perceptual process, but a very active and complicated activity of looking and seeing involving picked up selected features, synthesis along critical details, selection from a number of alternatives that is triaging and recognition, the end of a chain event. So we have got different, different neurons for this from retina to the visual pathway to the cortex, each one picks up one one phenomena. Uh, all of you know this, I'm not talking, I think you will be feeling bored or so, I don't know. And we have got movement perception, non-movement perception and uh, segmentation and figure ground recognition. That means you see a figure, you see a ground. So your figure should be picked up from the ground. For that you have got specific areas. Movement perception, you have got safe, uh, specific areas. Stationary object perception, you have got specific areas. There are nearly 30 extra straight areas which connect to a dozen other areas identified so that percept becomes meaningful. And vision for recognition is temporal look and vision for recognition involves eye movement and frontal look. And the primary information reaches straight cortex V1, then projected to secondary visual area V2 where reassembly and mapping of information takes place. And at V3, there is uh, moving and non-moving objects are recognized. V4, color and form is recognized. And area five, movement cells responsive to direction of the movement. Is it moving to the right or the left? That is processed at area five. And damage to V3 to V5, general impairment of form recognition. Damage to V4, color recognition. Damage to V5, a kinetopsia. So they do not perceive uh, movement. So you are standing in one place and later you are seeing another place. So the person will tell the people around me are jumping because they are not perceiving movement. They are seeing him at one place, then he is seeing it another place. And the patient will come and tell why all these people are jumping. We will think he is mad. It is not so. It is the V5 area dysfunction where he is not able to perceive the movement. He is able to only the position. So from here, he has moved there, but I didn't see him move so that it is jumping. And antagonistic control, that when you are moving to the right, the left should be suppressed. And so that is antagonistic control con and gain, rejection, what is triage and selection of information. All this is also taking place in the V5 area. <clears throat> then you have got movement perception, you have got depth perception, and you have got reflected image perception. And uh, yeah, when this become deranged, uh, you have got so many phenomena that is oculomotor apraxia, agnosia, and optic ataxia. You can have achromatopsia, you can have visual object agnosia, prosopagnosia, landmark or topographic agnosia. Uh, for letters or alexia, they said so many phenomena are there. Each one is interpreted in very good precision in different parts of the visual pathway. So, uh, so for this processing, so many properties are needed. I said that so many things I have just gone through very quickly only because it is a huge topic by itself. It is linked to the creator, how beautifully man has been designed. So without a creator, this cannot happen only. So this involves some principles called constancy. That is the ability to recognize an object in different views despite limitless range of retinal images produced by it. So you put it upside down, tilted, oblique, all those uh, planes, you should know this is an apple tilted up. So that is called constancy. That is by a principle called constancy of the information that is conveyed and processed. Unique or invariant properties of the objects like the neck of the giraffe is selected. So that will give the tag to the organ, object that is recognized. Then size, position, form, constancy using angle close, just start close. 
then categorical assigning to specific category so that is a second property of perceptual processing one is constancy second is categorizing third is experience dependent plasticity you go to another country and you see a small new thing and you repeatedly see it and then develop new synapses and learn that image and implicit is visual learning improves even complex skills by repetition whereas explicit learning is learning through working memory system for new characters so explicit is procedural learning implicit is uh, learned learning and then what is this convergent there is spatial orderliness in the occipital cortex we saw the various uh, um, cells in the occipital cortex they receive appropriate information from similar areas in the retina through columns and this is all there in the braces only if you read spending little more time this information is not purely philosophical it is there in pal braces and all this converge together to form the recognized information so supposing you see a cat we so many information it is making this sound it is a very loving to you this is called cat it has got a furry feel <coughs> it is cute looking that becomes the whole perception of what is seen <laughs> so when seen thing is disconnected from the temporal lobe you get loss of memory for what you see so this will be the lesion there so you can have various kinds of agnosia because each one is processed differently it may be body part so you may not know the body part or you may not know the space you may not know the time you may not know the object or you may not know synthesis or you may not know letter so it is classified by tetal bomb as this six categories or it may be based on recognition as i said a perceptive or associative a perceptive when nothing is seen, perceived so you cannot copy associative you perceive the contour so you can copy but you don't recognize then uh, how are you going to evaluate at the bedside at the bedside you can ask questions regarding the insight and the illness any perceived abnormality is there how is the end organ what about the language is there dementia does he recognize the gesture size shape angles colors can you draw the clock copy draw from memory draw a man test recognition of different faces length direction body parts so this is size these are shapes these are line orientation <laughs> symbol cards which we can carry and ask then you have got the bender just start cards <laughs> this is a nine card neuropsychological test to identify perceptual abnormality i will not elaborate all this so these are the nine cards in gender just start there you look into so many parameters and then put it into the normative data for the age education of that kind of particular person and then say whether this person's perception is normal or abnormal then you have got other method uh, second test used is visual object and space perception battery one is bender gesture three standard tests apart from the shapes and size i showed second is visual object and space perception battery which in uses eight task so all this you, you can go through the neuropsychology book it is difficult one task you can learn in one so like that so i will not elaborate all this so this is second test bender gesture is one second is the visual object and space perception battery where one to four uses incomplete letters all of you might carry this some of the neurology residents will be carrying it uh, eight may be partly put so you complete it the sill out is given object decisions and progressive sill out means you make the sill out more and more easy that will be quantifying the defect at what level you draw only the nail of the tiger he is recognizing or you draw the nail and the legs you draw the nail leg and the, its um, viscous so that is grading the severity of the uh, recognition defect the next is for space perception so dot counting so many dots are there where are they placed so that helps you to understand the spatial perception of this person then position analysis cube analysis and number locations so this is that visual object and space perception battery now this is available in the neuropsychology uh, testing kit module so you can take it and go through and do it now, so this is a second test used at the bedside then uh, you have got these are all timed test 
uh, how many how much time he takes what is his education and that is the uh, based on that you will uh, draw conclusion for a highly educated person the scores have to be different for a illiterate person the scores are different and so and, uh, that is um, then you have got a behavioral inattention test for neglect here you have got you use <coughs> traditional test that is life events and uh, i uh, like telephone dialing map navigation all these tests can be or coin sorting these are given to understand percept and then you find out interpret uh, by, from life events life events so it is what is going to affect us not the laboratory life events then this is uh, i am sure you know online dissection for neglect this is uh, letter can star cancellation you can look for neglect this is the complex figure of ray on this uh, also visual scanning and neglect these are simple tests very easy to do and uh, i will not elaborate any of them then it will become two day session so these are the various tools that are very easy and very simple and this is a, a cookie theft picture where how many concepts you are getting out of this picture and you compare it with your age and education and this is an enhanced battery 10 objects pictures and uh, shapes so this is a very simplified perception assessment score uh, bendens visual retention i am just introducing you to simple assessment of level 1 and level 2 level 3 and 4 we cannot evaluate at the bedside <clears throat> and this is to uh, find out how is the angles positions are recognized so pick up what is there above and match it with the one below so these are very simple tests which can be easily done and this is for face recognition the marked faces has to be recognized and matched with the old one the pyramid and the palm test so why it is the palm and match it with the pyramid so this kind of perception and functional matching these are all uh, validated tests and uh, we have got so many burkhim mom object recognition battery so many things are there if you are wanting to do some research base level you have to do then you have to go to the higher level then for the benefit of students what is cortical blindness what is cerebral blindness cortical blindness should not be there if you want to call a patient as cerebral blind cerebral blindness is bl agnosia so cortical blindness is in the cortex cerebral blindness in the circuit i said there are about 30 extra straight connections so it is in that circuit <coughs> cortical blindness is completely blind there is no mana fundus people and eye movements are normal and there is loss of occipital alpha Uh, and photic drive in the eeg where cerebral blindness is pathology in the circuit so they can have double hemianopia color agnosia crossed quadrantal hemianopia and you may have normal percept stripped of meaning it can be apperceptive or associative then uh, visual agnosia various types are there simultognosia failure to perceive simultaneously all elements like uh, you see a uh, Uh, so this is a, a, another agnosia what is this you are confused and angular gyrus you know that uh, finger agnosia all of us know uh, angular gyrus lesion and uh, as i said a perceptive person uh, he will not be able to uh, you see this is another test he has to perceive the whole correctly appropriate the papers put it into that so how much time he is taking so this is a test for a perceptive you see perceiving the whole is he matching it with the target is he putting it correctly or he is going through so many uh, lines and before he reaches the right one then you have got uh, other anomalies and uh, this is only level 1 and 2 that is anomia optica facia semantic defect i am not going to elaborate i think uh, this will be stressful <coughs> anomia optic facia modality specific naming defect whereas naming defect is for object specific supposing there is a modality specific naming defect called optic aphasia yeah very very so semantic naming defect process knowledge is lost so you do not understand uh, the phonemic understanding of uh, what is seen or heard <clears throat> so perceptive person as i said he cannot copy he copies so badly 
but you tell him to draw an apple from the memory, he will draw it correctly. That means the schema of the apple is, not, is there, but the end organ is also normal, but the end organ processing is defective. So he is uh, copying wrongly because just heart is not there. That is apperceptive. If it is, uh, this also apperceptive. If it is associative, you see he's copying normally, but not recognizing. Uh, copying normally, not recognizing. There is a little bit of a problem. Then Alexia, um, you have got the Alexia, pure Alexia, Alexia with agraphia and literal Alexia. If anybody wants, I can explain. I'm not going to uh, speak now, I think. We, have, we can sometimes split it into two sessions also. You have got uh, pure alexia, alexia with agraphia, and then literal alexia, surface alexia, and deep alexia. So we have got a neglect alexia. Five, six types of alexia is there. And um, pure alexia is occipital association area. Alexia with agraphia is angular gyrus. Third alexia is frontal lobe. It's a literal alexia. Uh, I'm just telling only. So they will read the whole thing, but they cannot read the spell reading. Each letter, Indian Express, if you read, they'll quickly read Indian Express. So why don't you read the spelling? They cannot read. You'll be surprised what happened. Surface Alexia is irregularly spelled word or not, like depth. You read it as depth, but it is depth. So irregularly spell, spelled words, they cannot read. That is Surface Alexia. Deep Alexia, they will convert uh, what they see into another aspect of that. For example, you show them a tube light, they will read it as, a, instead of telling it's a bulb or tube light, they will call it as light. Neglect is on the field of, on the area of neglect, they are unable to read. Then you have got uh, word blindness with normal language. Language is normal, but only words they are unable to uh, see. Or it can be objects or words. Uh, so that is word blindness. Then mirror images. So reflected images uh, also can be for emotions, for familiar people, faces, objects. Uh, so mirror agnosia and you have got mirror ego, mirror image agnosia. Mirror agnosia is spatial recognition of the object that is there in the mirror. That is the dorsal pathway. Whereas mirror image agnosia is recognizing the reflected image. That is mirror image agnosia. It's also a topic by itself. So here this person is trying to break in the mirror to get the apple. That is mirror agnosia. He is not knowing that the apple is behind him, not in the mirror. This is another example where the patient is going behind the mirror to capture the comb. This is mirror image agnosia, where this lady is talking to her own image and coming out and telling, here is a woman who does not know her name. She is going and asking, what is your name? What is your name? It is her own image. After that, she came and told us, here is a woman who does not know her name. That is mirror image agnosia. So these are the differences. The, so this is one person with mirror image agnosia. This person was talking to, so I am telling the clinical implication. He was a professor in Benares University. He was talking to his own image as if it is his nephew. Then he thought that um, his wife came inside. She was thinking to whom is he talking? So she opened the uh, mirror in the cupboard. He was seeing his own image in the mirror fixed to the cupboard and thinking it is his nephew and talking. She just opened the cupboard, the mirror disappeared. So the nephew disappeared. So this person made a complaint that his wife murdered his nephew. So actually it became a legal problem. Finally the nephew was alive. So that is the life implication of mirror image agnosia. <clears throat> Then all of us know about blind sight and Down's syndrome, and uh, you have got uh, various categorization defect in the visual field, abnormal position. I told three dimensional 
constancy, the phenomena of constancy in which an object is saved, that is above, below. Uh, so that constancy is lost. So you'll recognize only in one view, that is unconventional view test. So you may forget only the colors, or colors might fade, and uh, you may lose the completion, so you do not recognize the animal behind, and you cannot fix the appropriate object and the fix uh, appropriate holes. These are now used as ties for children. And sinus thesis, one mode became converted. I told that intramodality, intermodality, displacement, the principles when I told, first I mentioned that. So you see a, a number, it becomes a color. So that is called the phenomenon of modularity of the mind, forming new associations from a stim stimuli. We know that this is number six. So we have been told this is number six. But when a disease state, when there is breaking down and rewiring, this number six is converted into another stimuli. So forming new association from what is seen. Number six is seen, but number six is interpreted as color. New wiring, new associations. That is called the phenomenon of modularity of mind, which results in a pathological state called synesthesia. <clears throat> then simultognosia, as I told, you will say that this is a elephant is there, uh, temple is there, people are there. So this is a famous temple festival like that they will not say. Okay, I'm seeing elephant, I'm seeing a building, I'm seeing people, what is that? I don't know. So that's a piecemeal vision. They see only parts of it and they cannot assemble it in your whole. So I just made a, a very, very huge and very beautiful neurophilosophical subject into both basic level and higher level in bits and pieces. And it needs a long way to go to have a, uh, an understanding of what I am talking now. Uh, but only this much can be done in this time. And uh, according to Narayanayam, every being is part of the whole. So these are the principles I sold, uh, completion, cluster, all these principles. So every being is part of the whole. The perceived self is an illusion. Putting, as I told about the ambiguities, feeling the heat on their own body parts. The perceived self is an illusion, putting us in a prison, restricting everything about us. Our task is to free ourselves, to embrace the whole nature. So world becomes a very safe place. Then everybody is our relative. The whole world is our house. So the world becomes a very safe place. So that is, all, that is science to philosophy. I carried you through the principles and uh, I think uh, we have to read it over and over again and spend a lifetime based on ordinary mortal's capacity like me and highly uh, intellectual, didactic people coming from an intellectual background may do it much faster. And uh, face recognition uh, is uh, having a model. So uh, and it can be differently involved in life. What is the problem? Somebody who is living always with a person, it's a familiar face. So the children will come and tell this, my father is not at all recognizing me, but my brother is occasionally coming from America once in four years, he's recognizing. So that is another familiar face, famous face, novel face, crying face, like I said, contour, color, movement, stationary. Face also is split into so many things. So familiar face may not be recognized, that circuit may not be there. Novel face may be recognized. That will lead to a lot of confusion in caregivers and chaos in everyday life. So this we should be able to understand, explain to the caregiver that it is not that your father is not recognizing your services. That circuit is broken. So he no more knows the familiar faces. So that is <clears throat> thing. The clover boosie syndrome in stage AD. We can use these faces for the various tests. Then um, this is a... Uh, uh, another example of a person with optic ataxia, he was looking for targets away from the location, trying to lift the child away from the place where it is. That is optic ataxia. So this was his images and uh, cortical blindness. Uh, this was uh, um, CJD. So you can see the cortical hidden hands variety of uh, uh, CJD, but it's cortical blindness. So this person had so many visual phenomena which I just described. I am not going to elaborate. And this is allesthesia. 
you lose the displacement of the seen object. She is knowing the object, but seeing it in another place. So that is visual anesthesia and phantoms. So we know phantoms, which is not there, body part, which is not there. You perceive information from that part, which is not existing. You may think that there is a tumor and the patient might demand that you operate and remove that tumor, but that body part is not there. So for this, we do neuropsychological tricks. Their images are projected in the mirror and mirror surgery is done so that the body is tricked to understand, tricked, tricked to understand that the tumor from the non-existing body part has been removed. Otherwise, it is a very tormenting syndrome for the patient. And this is a alien hand. So he will say that his left hand is an alien hand because of the lack of body information. The left hand is not bringing body information to his self that this belongs to him. So he cannot use his left hand. When you tell him to hold it like this, he has to make so many movements, finally hold it and fix it. And he says many times that this fellow will not obey me. So this is a uh, self-perception is not there. So the brain is not recognizing this hand is his. So this is a failure of perception of body. So he thinks that this, so this hand will no more be owned by the brain. So it will not obey the commands of the brain. So that's a strange hand. So now we have got end organs, which may be normal or abnormal. If they are abnormal, it is very easy, the diagnosis. If it is normal, you go to the higher level and various levels of processing defect at perception. So limits of human perception, Human visual apparatus has not more than three dimensional vision. And Rishi is a fourth, fourth dimension, that is time. You can travel between the Dobara Yuga to Kali Yuga. So that is a fourth dimension. And but Vedas say that universe has 64 dimensions. That is why we are not seeing God. We have only two or three dimensions. How we can see the universe which has got so, so many dimensions? So universe is God. Universal consciousness is God. We don't have that perceptive equipment. So we are limited by our perceptual capacity. God exists everywhere. Jagadho, Dharan, and Vital. He spread everywhere in dimensions not visible to the naked eye. So current physics is trying to demonstrate. And I think this demonstration is one of the principles for which Nobel Prize has been awarded uh, this year. I think so. <clears throat> so five senses uh, carry the empirical truth, it's not the real truth. And so ever changing data learned and unlearned through the information carried through these end organs is empirical. So it is learned, unlearned, learned, unlearned. If you uh, medical students know, when you pass your exam, you learn something. Five years later, all that learned is nonsense. So you have to unlearn it and relearn it. Uh, so what worked for your patient at one point of time becomes total nonsense towards the end of your career. Uh, so how, who worked there and who gave the healing process? It is not your science because all of us know who have lived our life. What we learned to pass our exams, you're all obsolete now. Then how did the patients improve that time? So it is dharma. You practice dharma and God's hands uh, makes that dharma into truth. So the purpose of life, so this science which you are learning, I have uh, went, gone through the lower level and the higher level. But ultimately, you do the lower level. So if it is all higher level, why I should do the lower level? Lower level is the assigned duty. Assigned duty with the limitations of our sensation. So that has to be done with whatever is considered a truth at that point of time. Then the universal energy will converge and make it happen. So the purpose of life is to matter, to count, to stand for something which you truly believe is truth and to have made a difference that we lived at all. So if you do what small, small thing, cleaning a house, so that small, small thing you do with, uh, with the truth and commitment. Uh, so that will make a difference in a very small sense or big sense, whether what is small and what is big is also an illusion. So the small things may be the real big things. And one day the life will flash before our eyes on the day of our uh, demise, I think, and we must make sure it is worth watching for us. This is said in Bhagavad Gita. So the life you lived, at the end you plundered, took corruption, made money, do all nonsensical things, 
you yourself will get a discus. That should not happen. So when it flashes before us, it should be worth watching for our own self so that we can close our eyes in peace. So this is a dialogue in Chandyoga Upanishad between Udalaga and his son Sveda Kedu. So he is asking, Sveda Kedu, did you learn the things uh, which is beyond the sense organs? So the Durya level of learning is completion of learning. So that is that conversation. So Kena Upanishad say, Kena means by whom? So desired, directed the mind functions, prana moves forward. End organs uh, or, uh, and all other organs carry out their functions. Science is continuous pursuit of truth from the grass to the subtle. So one level and two level is grass. Three level and four level is subtle. Fourth level is natural only. Only thing we should have the capacity, we should be pure and we should perceive it like that. So perceive, uh, pursue it like that. So there is no supernatural in Indian thought. Since its concept of nature is very vast, the footprints of ultimate truth starts from its lower self, level one and level two, raised with unselfish dedication, and then the neurologist, the scientist, becomes neurologist, the philosopher. So true awareness, thinking of oneself as body, one becomes a collection of material things. Thinking of oneself as a collection of conscious awareness, it becomes like the uh, uh, part of the ocean. Like you ask your water in the pot, are you the ocean? It will say no. And you ask uh, ocean, is you, are you the pot? It will say no. You break the pot, it becomes same. That is merging into consciousness. Second level, losing the selfish cocoons. And identify the perceived as belonging to the perceiver. So what you see is an illusion. It is created by the great universe. And go beyond these small units. We understand that the current consciousness is what happens to us and not the true self. The true that stands out to witness the world as an entertaining show, that is the Maya. So the ultimate consciousness in which endless persons come, emerge, disappear. So all this is illusion. So uh, death and birth should not be a Cause for fear. Of course, I fear a lot. I am a very emotional person. I am at a very low level of understanding only, but I am trying to read all this. So this is the greatness of ancient wisdom of this great nation called our mother India. And what this uh, mayor of Rochester told to the people who visited the, that country, I humbly request you to tell your people to remain wedded to your ideals then this I shall take as your greatest contribution to the people of America. Do not try to imitate my people. Instead, carry your information to my country and make that as the contribution to the people of America. That means you see what was the greatest level of cognitive thinking of our great grandfathers. I do not understand much. I just read it and spoke and I still live at a level one only. So ultimate understanding is, I am that, Aham Brahmasmi. So this was a filler session I did because we could not get a volunteer for today. And I introduced uh, our people to our the ancient wisdom of this country. A very small fraction of the ancient wisdom of this country. I introduced, I, anybody can give comments, criticism. I am myself not knowing many of the things. <laughs>